And on behalf of MSFS, the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, and the Mortara Center for International Studies and Georgetown University Press, it's a real honor to welcome everyone to our official book launch of Human Dignity and the Future of Global Institutions. And you haven't even read the book yet, so that, that, that's, a, that's a good start. Tony? Yeah. Excellent. It is my honor, as you can tell from the book, to be the co-author here with my friend and colleague Mark Lagon. This was really Ambassador Lagon's idea, and he took the lead role in this, and so I, I went along in this wonderful project and we'll be talking a little bit more about the details. But I want to say a couple things about the international system and the context in which this book was being produced. It probably goes without saying that this is a tumultuous period in the history of international affairs. And one could go into all the details of what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on with Ebola, the issues with ISIS and terrorism, but the one thing that we have seen in the international system is a change, a proliferation in the international actors. Clearly states still exist in the international system, but we've seen a proliferation of intergovernmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, sub-state actors, super-state actors, trans-state actors, and as Mark and I describe it, drawing on some of the earlier works of Headley Bull, we see the international system as neo-medieval. So many disparate actors, multiple authorities, overlapping hierarchies. So how can we make sense of the international system? The fundamental thesis of the book is that human dignity should serve as the guiding principle for all these institutions. It should serve as the touchstone as these institutions, as varied as they may be, try to carry on their work. And so what we end up doing in the book is coming up with a working definition of human dignity. Not a definitive definition, but something that can get us started, can get the conversation going. Based on that definition, we've been able to select a number of very distinguished authors to explore different organizations and how these organizations, how these global institutions either do, in fact, promote human dignity or, in some cases, should promote human dignity. We then end the book with a plea. The plea is to take this concept of human dignity, to take this book as a starting point, to seek to promote what we call a dignitarian dialogue one which will engage members of the international system, one which engage various organizations and institutions in an effort to make human dignity truly foundation of international affairs. Now, we will be saying a lot more about the details of the book as we progress. Mark will be talking about some of these aspects. Nicole Bibbins Sadaka, another one of our chapter authors, will be talking about that. So we'll be getting into the details of the book and obviously opening things up for questions and answers. But before we get started, we thought it might be nice to bring in a distinguished practitioner of international affairs, and indeed a great friend of Georgetown University, and Ambassador Don McHenry. Don McHenry, as many of you know, has had a distinguished career as a diplomat. He has worked at major think tanks in the United States, at Brookings, at Carnegie, at the Council on Foreign Relations. He has served on the boards of Coca-Cola, International Paper, and a variety of private sector organizations that play a role in international affairs. And for many years, until his announcement was announced fairly recently, his retirement was announced fairly recently, has been a distinguished professor in the practice of international affairs at Georgetown. Don served as the deputy UN ambassador under Jimmy Carter, and then in 1979 was made the permanent representative of the United States to the United Nations, a role in which he promoted human dignity in so many different ways. So to offer a few reflections about the book, let me turn it over to my friend and Anand, a great friend of Georgetown, Don McHenry.
Thanks very much, Tony. Uh, I thought that I might kick this off by uh, recognizing the tremendous uh, uh, puzzle, if you will, uh, that the authors of this book have sought to solve. Uh, we've been, as I think back on the, on the uh, not the my last uh, century, but the uh, since the beginning of the 1900s and up to now, the international community has been <laughs> fooling around with how to um, take from states or assist states uh, in the promotion of human rights, and I'll get to the term human dignity in a moment, uh, from the time of the organization of the International Labor Organization, uh, through the development of the covenant of the League, uh, the uh, writing of the Charter of the UN and its amendments, if you will, the, um, the Universal Declaration, and with so many other amendments and uh, agreements which have taken place in the end. <coughs> What we've recognized, in a sense, is that it has always been easier to get countries, organizations, groups, uh, to agree to concepts than it has been to get enforcement. Uh, after all, there, no one wants to have to answer positively uh, to the question, have you stopped beating your wife yet? And so, in order to avoid that, it's relatively easy to uh, get agreement on concepts. The trick comes in trying to get agreement on what they mean. And even more difficult is to get agreement on how to enforce it. What do you mean? And what is the means of, of enforcement? And in trying to answer both of those questions, what do you mean and how do you enforce, we occasionally decide that the track we're on is not going to work or it has all kinds of objections to it and we need to modify it. We need to follow that song. Sometimes it takes a spoonful of sugar to make the medicine go down. That's what happened with the concept of humanitarian intervention. Humanitarian intervention initially was greeted uh, even by African countries after the situation in uh, East Africa. But after a while, people started expressing concern. It was reminding them too much of past colonialism and so forth. And so, largely at the push of Kofi Annan and others, they came up with this concept, responsibility to protect. I don't see much difference between responsibility to protect and humanitarian intervention. But the fact is, it did end up being that spoonful of sugar that made the medicine go down. And I have always felt that if it's necessary to make those kinds of changes to further and further clarify what our objectives are, that I saw and see no reason why those kinds of changes shouldn't be made. I think we continue, we need to continue to push, whatever you call it, of the concept of human rights and human dignity. And if on occasion we have to call it responsibility to protect instead of humanitarian intervention, so be it. 
But I, as you might imagine, coming from uh, one of those uh, who has uh, been in the trenches and trying to get implementation, I have always felt that the key to implementation was the big hurdle. That somehow we had to find ways in which we could get people who are quite willing to accept the concept of equality among the sexes or uh, 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 the recognition of cultural uh, differences. How do you move that beyond so that it is implemented in fact? I think this is a dynamic process. And we already see many changes, in fact, changes which are coming so swiftly that we sometimes don't recognize them. The period in which these questions were left to the state uh, has long passed. The period in which uh, the international community in terms of simply governments trying to get together for agreements has also passed. Uh, today, the question of implementation, in fact, and today even the question of the concept, is one which involves non-governmental organizations, multinational corporations, uh, various um, humanitarian operations, such as Medicines Without Frontier, uh, as well as the new phenomenon, social media. And while it is necessary for there to be a continuation of the effort to get agreement on concepts, we have to recognize that the participants in that process is much more, uh, much larger today uh, than it was in the past. I have a concern as I have looked upon the effort, the implementation effort, and that is that sometimes in our effort to get implementation of concepts, we shoot ourselves in the foot. There are a number of pitfalls which occur, and one or two of them are mentioned in this book. Sure, we want to get Osama bin Laden. But who was giving some thought that the manner of getting Osama bin Laden might have undermined our effort to wipe out polio? Sure, we want to relieve the flight of Libyans, but who was giving some thought that the manner of doing so might undermine responsibility to protect and give a rational, in my view not acceptable, but a, a rationale uh, for others in situations which were to come. And here I have Syria uh, particularly in mind. We want to push the concept of an international criminal court. But we need to find a way of doing so in a manner which does not undermine the concept of the court. Here I'm thinking particularly of the difficulty we have had in recent times uh, from African countries who have come around to believing that the international criminal court is meant only for Africans or only for uh, poor or weak countries. It seems to me that uh, these concepts, which after you get past the first chapter of this book and the last chapter, that in between those two chapters, uh, the writers have sought to wrestle 
uh, with not just the concepts of human rights and human dignity, not just the way in which we can get people uh, on the same wavelength in terms of what we're talking about, but they have sought to wrestle with the implementation and the problems which arise, whether you are talking about uh, non-governmental organizations, so faith-based institutions or others, uh, in the process of trying to promote what we all tend to accept, even those who come up with excuses find themselves having to accept and that there are cer certain standards which we want to think that we are following. And I think it's the value of this book that not only is there a, an attempt to wrestle with the concept, but uh, as any good sandwich, uh, the meat of it is the chapters in between uh, which deal with the effort at implementation. So I commend Tony, you and the authors, uh, for this uh, contribution to, uh, to our understanding. Thank you very much, Don, for the very kind words. This project was very much a collaborative project of people associated with Georgetown. Now, obviously, my dear friend Mark Lagon and I are associated with Georgetown, but all the authors, in one way or another, have some kind of association. They're alums, they're faculty members, they're former faculty members, and so another theme underlying the entire book was this Georgetown connection. And some of them may talk a little bit more about that. I want to present my friend and my collaborator, Mark Lagon. And I want to begin by saying this project was a lot of fun. Now, every book and every research project should always be a lot of fun. But this was particularly enjoyable, and in large part because Mark and I were able to work extremely closely together. Now, I want to begin with a sad note before I officially introduce him. The sad note is, as I think many of you know, Ambassador Lagon is going to be leaving Georgetown as of January 1st. That's sad. The great news is he has been selected to be president of Freedom House, an amazing human rights organization that was co-founded. <laughs> was co-founded by Eleanor Roosevelt, who was one of the prime architects of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, so Mark is following in this long lineage from Eleanor Roosevelt down to present time. Uh, wow. Yeah, see? <laughs> this is significant. Mark, as many of you know, is undergraduate at Harvard University and then wised up and came to Georgetown where he did his PhD working with Professor Bob Lieber and the late Jean Kirkpatrick another US ambassador to the United Nations. He taught for a number of years and then said, I love teaching, but I, I need to get into the policy world a little bit. So he worked on Capitol Hill for a number of years, then came over into the executive branch where he was at policy planning at the State Department. He became a deputy assistant secretary of state in the Bureau of International Organization. And then he became US ambassador where he ran the US office to combat human trafficking. For a year, he headed an NGO called the Polaris Project, which worked on preventing human trafficking. And then we were able to persuade him to come back to Georgetown for four years as a professor in the practice of international affairs and our concentration chair for global politics and security. With all that experience, we were able to do so many things together. And I see so many of his current students out there and former students who benefited from his wisdom and experience. I benefited from his wisdom and experience in putting together this book, and I'm going to turn it over to my friend Mark Lagon to talk a little bit about that. Well, um, before thinking about some of the concepts in the book, I, I, I want to offer some thanks first to Richard Brown, um, who leads the Georgetown University Press. Um, as I said to him minutes ago, 
Uh, Georgetown University Press was a, a dream to work with. Uh, really supportive of the idea, really supportive of getting to the finish line producing this book. Um, you know, anyone should want to write for, for Richard, so thank you. Um, I want to thank Tony, uh, who leads an environment at, at the MSFS program um, where people really feel part of a, a team, and it was only natural that we would create a book project that was not just people presenting papers at a conference and they get thrown together in a book, but something truly interactive and collaborative. Um, you know, not co-conspirator, but thank you for being my collaborator on, on everything in, at, at uh, Georgetown in the last four uh, or so years. Um, but I especially want to thank current students and, and former students who have taken the time to, to come here. Um, as this book reflects, I'm your student too. Um, we've been puzzling with um, the repeated and diverse references and invocations of the idea of human dignity. And what's up with that? The Dalai Lama said over 20 years ago, Buddhism recognizes that human beings are entitled to dignity, that all members of the human family have an equal and inalienable right to liberty, not just in terms of political freedom, but also at the fundamental level of freedom from fear and want. Several years later, the Aga Khan who's the hereditary imam of the Ismaili Muslims and uh, leads a major philanthropic institution um, in faith-based work, um, said in 2006, the search for justice and security, the struggle for equality of opportunity, the quest for tolerance and harmony, the pursuit of human dignity, these are the moral imperatives which we must work towards and think about on a daily basis. Many people have taken up um, ideas which we drew on in trying to look at an operational, an implementable um, concept of human dignity. The ancient thinkers in the West from Plato uh, forwarding a concept of spiritedness that drives human beings, or thymos, to Aristotle, who through the concept of eudaimonia looks at the importance of human flourishing as a top goal, they inform the concept. Clearly, the Judeo-Christian tradition, suggesting that all human beings are innately of equal value, all created in the image of their creator, informs this idea. Immanuel Kant's view that all human beings are agents, should be viewed as agents, having inherent value, not to be used as mere means, influenced us a great deal. More recently, if you can call just after World War II, more recently, the secular human rights system of the UN embedded ideas of human dignity. Indeed, Eleanor Roosevelt, in leading the negotiation for uh, the United States of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, pressed for an emphasis on human dignity as a premise. Um, Marianne Glendon, um, uh, a Harvard Law professor who, who's quite interested in the concept of human dignity as a Catholic thinker, notes that in the negotiations of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, Mrs. Roosevelt, she says, when her term came in the negotiations, said that the word dignity had been considered carefully by the Human Rights Commission, which had included it in order to emphasize that every human being is worthy of respect. In the scheme of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, Article I did not refer to specific rights because it was meant to explain why human beings have rights to begin with, because dignity is important. And this idea has been carried forward to others. More recently in the UN, the work of the UN Development Program, Jerome will be pleased I mentioned that, um, has focused on agency for people to be able to apply their capabilities, or what people of faith would call their God-given talents. Um, and finally, we've been influenced by the thinker Francis Fukuyama, who says, picking up on uh, Plato's concept of thymos, that people crave recognition, that individual human beings need to be recognized. And so with this, Tony and I and our, our collaborators in this project offer a definition, a working definition of dignity. Because dignity is one of those terms that you can say is up there in the clouds and can't be pinned down. But we want to make the job tough on ourselves. We say dignity 
is about, one, the agency of human beings, their ability autonomously to apply their gifts and thrive. And secondly, dignity is not just a matter of individuals living in an atomistic way. They live in a social context. Each person's inherent value needs to be recognized by society. They need to have equal access to opportunity. Social recognition, the kind of thing that Francis Fukuyama talks about, is essential. But we try and make it even harder on ourselves with our definition by suggesting that human dignity, to be meaningful, has to be institutionalized in practice and governance, precisely what Ambassador McHenry is saying, um, that implementation is crucial. So in short, what we're suggesting is human dignity is kind of an umbrella con concept that sits over human rights as the more common parlance which one finds in treaties, the UN, law. And while human dignity is the concept that's the premise, it's also the test of implementation. How do you get human rights? How do you test whether you are making a difference on the ground in implementation, not just on paper and laws uh, and treaties? Well, we suggest that if you say agency and social recognition are the test of dignity, then you could test a program of a faith-based NGO or of the UN Development Program to see does it advance agency for people and does it advance their social recognition? Some other people who are more quantitatively inclined might want to start measuring. Tony referred to a neo-medieval world. This is an idea that comes from the scholar Hedley Bull in his book, The Anarchical Society. There are many different actors that have emerged over the last half century and especially in the last quarter century other than the states. Global intergovernmental organizations, regional organizations, transnational actors, multinational corporations. And so a major theme of our book is there are really two kinds of institutions. There are the traditional intergovernmental organizations, and I will say, I insist they remain very important. Those who tell me as a constructive critic of the United Nations that, they, that um, the UN is broken, I will respond, we need intergovernmental organizations like it. Um, that's why some of the chapters focus on such institutions. For instance, our colleague Todd Lindbergh has written about something in the book that most people, even human rights specialists who are professionals, some in the room, probably don't know all that much about, which is the victim restitution mechanisms of the International Criminal Court. The great advocates of the International Criminal Court and those who are worried about its politicized or regionally focused African um, uh, you know, uh, focused agenda don't tend to talk about this side, uh, dignity, dignity improving side of the ICC's work. Our colleague Anoop Singh, um, who is now in Hong Kong working for JP Morgan and, and what wrote this chapter as the head of the Asia division of the IMF, looks at the way the IMF helps build rule of law and um, expectations for the formal economy helping the agency and recognition of the poor in many countries. But there is a second kind of institution that our book focuses on. And those are the new partnerships, the hybrids um, that one sees. Perhaps the most striking would be that um, which our colleague Rosalia Rodriguez Garcia writes about, which is those that work to fight HIV AIDS and grapple with the problem that the most, most likely people to be ravaged by AIDS tend to be stigmatized populations whether they be males having sex with males, intravenous drug users, those who are in the sex industry. The Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria is a combination of intergovernmental organizations like the UN and the World Bank, but then also foundations, corporations, and NGOs. Corporations themselves are global institutions which can advance dignity. Our colleague, Mike Samway, um, focuses on the moral dilemmas of companies advancing opportunity and information for people in societies where the governments are autocratic. And you'll hear shortly from Nicole Bibbins Sadaka about another one of those other institutions which aren't intergovernmental organizations, faith-based institutions. So finally, as uh, Tony Arendt alludes to, 
the book calls for a discussion, a reframing of what the main premise of what international institutions, whether the traditional intergovernmental ones or these other hybrids and partnerships, a, a, a dignitarian dialogue, a dialogue between people, cultures, faiths, about first principles, and one that's willing to incorporate disagreement, not to just take our definition and stick with it, but to, in an almost like dialectical way, incorporate changes and challenges. The dialogue has to be very importantly exactly on what Ambassador McHenry refers to, operationalizing. How do institutions actually in practice extend agency and recognition? There needs to be a dialogue on that. And their choices. What are the priority tasks? When you decide about whether you're going to stop a threat to innocent people uh, in the head of a terrorist network, um, like Osama bin Laden, are you deprioritizing other things, like polio? We suggest that there are many venues for this dignitarian dialogue. It may not just be in the universal membership organizations like the UN, they may be in re regional organizations, even some surprising ones. I have to say I'm a little surprised at how um, vocal the Arab League has been about um, some humanitarian calamities in Libya and Syria. Um, it might be a place for dialogue. The G20, which incorporates some 80% of the world's population and um, share of world GDP, would be a place for that dialogue. Um, institutions and partnerships that lie at the nexus of health and development um, are important. The virtual world, um, a new place for dialogue um, out, out there on the internet and social media. But finally, the university is a place for this. And our colleague, Tom Banshoff, a contributor to the book, the vice president of the university, has really helped us focus on that idea. The university is a place for this dialogue to occur. We think the elephant in the room remains the United States. So what does the US have to do with this? It is too coy to suggest the United States should stand back and not be a vigorous promoter of human dignity. It shouldn't take over the dialogue. But as there will be suspicion that human dignity is somehow a Trojan horse for the US way of doing things, it should be a cultivator, not a hegemonic player, not a coy band, a bystander, but a cultivator of this dialogue. I hope you, you all will join us um, over time in, in promoting that dialogue. And now it is a pleasure to introduce another one of our collaborators. Um, I've worked with Nicole Bibbins Sadaka for a number of years. I met her uh, at the State Department um, when she was a uh, senior advisor to the Under Secretary of State for um, Democracy and Global Affairs. Um, she was a senior civil servant after having been um, a student in the MSFS program and a presidential management intern, I guess it was called the intern at that stage. Um, she has worked outside of government uh, in uh, such places as for the International Republican Institute in Ecuador and uh, has served as the chair of the board of two faith-based organizations, um, the Institute for Global Engagement and uh, International Justice Mission, currently the chair of International Justice Mission. Um, her day job is as Washington director for the NGO um, uh, uh, Independent Diplomat. Um, and she's going to share some of her thoughts related to her chapter on faith-based institutions. Well, it is a pleasure to be here. I've long looked forward to this book coming out, so it's great to see it out and um, on the bookshelves. And I will try to live up to Ambassador McHenry's challenge, I guess it is, to be the meat of the sandwich, um, as, as he put it. The chapter that I wrote uh, focused on faith-based organizations. And I wanted to share with you a few of the trends that we see going on within the faith community, within the faith-based organization community and its impact in the international arena these days as an illustration of many of the concepts which um, Tony and Mark have put forward. Are we in this medieval, neo-medieval era? And is human dignity an issue around which we can begin a dialogue and can start to look 
one step past what has become somewhat of a stalemated discussion about human rights in the, uh, in the international system. Faith-based organizations are ones that have long talked about human dignity, have long held human dignity as a cornerstone of their work. It's not coincidental that Mark uh, quoted both the Dalai Lama as well as Aga Khan. You could probably list several of the popes and a number of evangelical organizations there as well as organizations that have been talking about this concept of human dignity for a very long time and have used it as their motivating factor in the work that they've been doing around the world. Um, I just wanna go through a few trends that we have seen within this community and then look back at the questions that, that have been posed in the initial chapters of this. What we have seen and scholars have pointed to over time is that rather than decreasing over time, the role that religion has played in the international system has only increased. Scholars after the Second World War assumed that once societies became more educated, became more connected, became more developed, religion would simply fall away and we wouldn't have to deal with it anymore, people would modernize. What we've actually seen is a growing religiosity in the international system. The Pew Foundation just did a study a few years back in which they said 84% of the world's population right now believes in something higher than themselves and affiliates themselves with some sort of religion. So you have this trend of growing religiosity in the world. At the same time, you have a decrease in the confidence that many individual citizens have in their states, in their states to deliver on basic um, governance and on basic services. So you have those two trends coming together at the same time. At the same time, scholars have been noting, um, and there was an interesting piece in The Economist recently, about the growing uh, role that NGOs have played in the international system. Just when we saw the Berlin Wall fall, we, thought, we saw about 20,000 NGOs at that time doing work around the world. 10 years later, that number was up to 54,000. What that says is NGOs are taking a greater role in the international system. And in fact, now we see there are more NGOs that are providing basic human services than the UN itself. So it's an interesting trend to look at to say, here we have non-governmental organizations which are not accountable to any citizens, not accountable to any state directly, are providing more of the basic services that we assume states or inter or state-based international organizations, those organizations, those non-governmental organizations are providing more of those services than states or state-affiliated organizations. So we have these trends coming together, increasing religiosity, low confidence in states, the growth of the NGO sectors, and as well, there are a lot of societal trends that we have seen going on. People, as the confidence in states have decreased, we've seen more individuals and societies have more confidence in their ethnic and religious affiliation as opposed to their national affiliation, which means people are looking across borders or across seas to have an affiliation based on their ethnicity or based on their religion with someone who lives thousands of miles away as opposed to an affiliation with someone in their own country just based on the fact that they have the same passport. So you have a transnational trend of affiliations and global communities which transcend national identities and have people focusing much more on those religious identities at the same time. And naturally, the technological changes that we've seen over the past 15 years have just enhanced that. People are able to um, connect with others in their same religious group much more easily and to know about what's going on in their faith communities and be reinforced within their faith communities than they ever have been. And so people who were minorities in one way are now connected in a way which they never have. So all of these trends have come together, the growth of NGOs globally, the growing religiosity, and the group that has been at that crossroads, at that nexus, are really faith-based organizations. And what we have seen is a growing, uh, a growing influence of faith-based organizations which are now operating internationally. Because states have not been able in many places in the world to provide basic um, services to their citizens, NGOs, and, and particularly faith-based NGOs, have been able to enter into countries and provide services. We see places in Africa and Asia where 60 or 70% of healthcare is provided by international faith-based organizations, which means clearly the state is not playing that role, and individual citizens are now looking to faith-based groups as their primary source of health care, a trend which no one expected when we saw the international system developing singularly around states. 
So that role that faith-based organizations has been able to play because of the weakness of states and because of the confidence that people are putting in NGOs has just expanded the ability of faith-based organizations to, um, to grow roots in many of these societies. Likewise, um, many have looked to some of these organizations um, because of their faith orientation and because of the growing religiosity that we see in societies as well, many, of, many individuals have turned with greater comfort to faith-based organizations than they have to secular international organizations. We have seen trends, and there have been a number of studies that have been done, where uh, faith-based organizations, even of different faiths, have had the ability to enter into more conservative societies where secular organizations have not been able to enter. And so simply that moniker of being a faith-based organization has given access to deliver basic health care, basic food and shelter in places where secular organizations have not been able to, to enter. Um, so we see all of these trends coming together, and what we see then is these organizations, faith-based organizations, which have long been talking about this concept of human dignity, taking a greater role in the international system, replacing in places what is traditionally seen as a state-based role, and playing a role which, which is a much stronger one. Another trend which we've also seen is that faith-based organizations moving into countries have natural networks often. For, for example, in the Catholic Relief Services, enters into a country that has Catholic churches, it's able to reach out to a much broader audience and gain confidence of that audience, which secular organizations have not been able to. This is all not to downplay the tremendous role that's played by international organizations still, played by secular organizations, but it's just to point out that this is a trend that is coming alongside of what work those other organizations have been doing. So going back to the concept which Mark put out of are we in this neo-medieval era, some of the points which had been um, raised by Headley Bull's study is to look at several trends that point to the fact that we are in a neo-medieval era. And I'll just point to three of the five that he pointed to which are reinforced by uh, the faith-based, the trends that we see in the faith-based organizations. He pointed to the issue of disintegration of states. That doesn't mean that states are going to be completely replaced by any means, but what it means is we're seeing around the world an, a decrease in the role that states are playing on monopolizing all services and monopolizing all um, activities, which we had previously thought only belonged to states. As we see NGOs and, and faith-based organizations entering into that, we see a decreased role in many countries of what a state uh, the role that a state is playing. If we look right now at what is happening in West Africa with the response to the Ebola crisis, we're seeing states which are completely incapable, unfortunately, to deal with a tremendous health problem. And what you see is that even the World Health Organization has not been able to completely <laughs> address the issue, and you have non-governmental organizations alongside of states and alongside of international organizations. And within those NGOs, naturally, there are faith-based organizations. So what you're seeing is it is no longer a state response to a health crisis like this. It's a, it's a response that is multifaceted, and it's just showing that we have more actors um, on the field. Two other points that Headley Bull uh, put together or uh, uh, posited, transnational organizations. We are seeing much more transnational affiliations within faith groups. The Catholic Church is naturally a network that exists throughout the world and has very strong ties between, between groups. But there are also just informal affiliations that exist between faith groups in different countries where people feel, as I mentioned before, that affinity between faith groups of different societies. And then lastly, the technological unification of the world. The fact that technology has brought communities together and has started to create identities among different groups um, that didn't exist previously because it's, a, it's facilitated by technology and that those identities have now allowed people to have more of a affinity, an affinity for their faith-based group or some ethnic group or some other part of their identity than just their national identity. So if we step back and we say we're seeing these trends within the faith-based organization community and this is a group that is playing a much stronger role in the international um, system. And this is a group that has been talking about human dignity for a very, very long time. It does point to the fact that we may be on the precipice, as this book argues, of having an, 
of a need to have a dialogue about what that next step is going to look like, and maybe human dignity will be that organizing principle. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, of course, the sign of Nicole's commitment to this collaborative project is that she is the mother of her third child, who is 10 days old and is in the rear of the room. Um, so thank you for coming, nonetheless. Um, it's a privilege to uh, invite Soon to offer some thoughts on this book and, and this topic um, from a colleague and friend of a number of years. Um, Lodi Gary um, is from Tibet. Lodi Gary was recognized according to Tibetan Buddhist tradition as the reincarnate Lama of a Buddhist master, and he began his monastic studies at the age of four. At age nine, he fled from Myarong with his family, avoiding pursuit by the Chinese People's Liberation Army, and led a group of fellow Tibetans in safety to India. Beginning in India, he committed himself to a career-long role in the central Tibetan administration in exile of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And he served as the speaker of the Tibetan parliament in exile uh, and at the level of deputy cabinet minister and cabinet minister, uh, finally in the role of uh, minister of information and international relations. In 1991, um, as we would say it in the United States, the Dalai Lama tapped Lodi Gary to be his special envoy, and he became um, soon thereafter the president of the well-known NGO, International Campaign for Tibet. Um, he was charged um, in 1998 by the Dalai Lama to serve in that role as special envoy to reestablish formal contacts with Chi the Chinese government. And between 2002 and 2010, um, he led nine formal rounds of meetings with Chinese authorities, ultimately resigning his position in 2012 as the situation in Tibet was deteriorating, there were increasing incidents of Tibetan self-immolations, and he was deeply frustrated by the lack of positive response from the Chinese authorities. Lodi Gary has committed himself to communicating the middle way philosophy of the Dalai Lama, seeking genuine autonomy for Tibet within the People's Republic of China, allowing harmony between the Tibetan and Chinese people. Um, and he really has been committed to the imperative to preserve the distinct culture and religious traditions of Tibet and the right of Tibetans to have their own identity and dignity. Thank you for joining us and offering your comments. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark, for your very kind words. Uh, Ambassador and I, in fact, I'm very happy that you called me a friend and a colleague. I certainly didn't work at the State Department, nor at the US Congress. But yes, we, uh, we are colleagues, because uh, every time I went to see Mark, either at the Congress or at the State Department, I didn't go to lobby with him. I went to strategize with him, because the issues that he fought for, and the issues that uh, at least I made an effort to be part of, were of common interest. So therefore, I think uh, uh, it is not wrong for me to call uh, you know, a friend, definitely I'm honored, but also a colleague. But first, I must apologize for coming late. You know, I'm from Tibet, and uh, we are nomads, and we're supposed to be very good at navigating, you know, looking at the mountain, <laughs> looking at the river, and the night, looking at the stars. But when a nomad is get thrown into, you know, Washington, D.C., you see that nomad gets lost. So, so I went to the wrong building. I even went to the wrong floor. And it, in fact, in fact it'd be even more embarrassing that I do have a a kind of humble connection with this university as a research scholar with the Asian studies, but that keeps me mostly to the front portion of the <laughs> university. So I do really apologize because I resent sometimes, you know, because the part that I come from, except the Japanese, you know, we are a little sloppy with time. In fact, you call it about ending standard time, Tibetan standard time. 
And I never really liked that. And I always insisted that people come on time. I think some 10 years back when an NGO uh, funded by US Congress started walking inside bed. So I told them, I said, look, I want you to just, you know, you to be one favor. Whenever you give an appointment to some Tibetans who come to see you, if they come 10 minutes late, just look at the watch and give a body language that you're not happy. <laughs> if they're 15 minutes late, tell them, well, I'm sorry, you have only 15 minutes because you're late. If they come half an hour, even if you had all the time, cancel the meeting. Because I said, really very important that even things like coming on time, keeping time, I think are very important. So I'm both embarrassed and I apologize for <laughs> coming late. Now, I wanted to compliment both of you, Tony and Mark, for this very important work. Having said that, uh, this book was given to me by my friend last week when uh, we were at uh, the Council on Foreign Relations where he was making a very important presentation. And the sense then I did try uh, you know, to go through it, read some portions of it, uh, and to be very candid, uh, some of it a little bit way above my understanding. But one thing I can say that as Mark have said it, I think this is the beginning of very important discussion. You know, defining things like human dignity, human rights are complicated, but you make an effort, you know, that's very important. However, what I felt is that, you know, immediately I went through, and then I was looking for some of the authors who have, uh, there was one, Singh. So I said, oh, maybe there is a kind of looking at the whole issue of human dignity and all the issues that you bring up from, uh, let's say, from a Hindu philosophical point of view. Uh, and I looked, you know, a few others, uh, uh, but as, uh, you know, to be very candid, as I think the two of you mentioned, and also one author mentions, it's very much a judeo -Christic, Christian kind of concept of looking at these things. Now, I compliment. In fact, uh, yesterday afternoon, I was with another good friend, Professor Stephen Rockefeller in New York, and we were discussing about that. In fact, the lack of active participation by us Buddhists, for example, on fight for social justice, we talk so much about it. All our religious scholars, thousands of them, talk so much about that. But we are not really active. In this, no doubt, the, the Judeo-Christian uh, you know, tradition has really done marvelous work, and we want to learn. But I think it is important, and I want to encourage, uh, even if Mark, I believe, will go to a different institution, which I think, for me, is going to be equally important, if not more important. <laughs> But I think this need to be, you know, as you have rightly said, Mark, beginning of a discussion. I think it's very important to have the views from other traditions. Um, for example, Confucius. Not from the state-sponsored Confucius institutions that is mushrooming <laughs> everywhere, but from people like Professor Tu Ming. Uh, formerly, I think he still is affiliated with the Harvard University, a good friend. Now he spends more time in China but a real good Confucius scholar, how they look at this, how they define it. And similarly, I think from uh, Buddhist and the Hindu traditions, the reason is because this is a global issue we're dealing with. So therefore, we have to look at the, this, all these issues, even to defining it from every tradition. And I'm sure at the end of the day, it will be very universal, because these are issues where I don't think there's going to be any fundamentally different uh, interpretations, but I think it will be very important for the credibility of such work if there is also solid views from all these traditions. So I just wanted to, you know, uh, encourage that you know this be a discussion, uh, that more thoughts and more traditions are brought uh, into this. Uh, then obviously, you know, there's a lot of discussions about the importance of the global institutions, and uh, many of them, uh, I agree with you, were set up you know, for the purpose of bringing social justice, for the purpose of, you know, human dignity, for the purpose of human rights. But unfortunately, sometimes these great institutions that, uh, you know, we have created also become sometimes instrument of exploitation. Collaborators with uh, uh, governments, with uh, authoritarian uh, institutions. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, as Nicole, you know, my other good friend and colleague said that, yes, these are very important. I'm not one of those who says that all, all these global institutions are bad, they should be. No, certainly not. These are very necessary. Very necessary, but then again, I think we really have to look at it. 
you know, how, you know, those institutions can be, uh, can live to the, the hope that was there when they were created. You know, the, you, you began to discuss about that, but I think maybe not just discussing about maybe ways how it could be made a better instrument for bringing social justice and so forth. And then another thing, you know, this is very much, you know, related to that, you talk about the issue of stateless, we talk about nationality. Here, of course, you're talking about nationality, I mean, according to you, in, I think, term of, you know, country, like, you know, Chinese nationality or Chinese. But, but they, within China, as you know, there are different nationalities, for example. The Chinese define me as a Tibetan nationality. And uh, since last four or five years, for example, there has been moved by some section of the Chinese Communist Party and some scholars saying that, oh, we should get away with this leveling, you know, our people with the different nationalities, you know, Tibetan, Mongol, uh, you know, Uyghur, because this kind of doesn't help with the national integration. We are all Chinese. We should try to get rid of that. Now that obviously, you know, you know for, for someone like me, Tibetan, it takes away then, you see, not only dignity, the very, you know, uh, the, the, the existence of Tibetans as a separate you know, entity. How do you deal with that? Because first of all, it is a within a kind of state, but it's not so even within states, you see this issue of nationality and uh, so, so those are also, I think, issues that you know, need to be you know, looked at. Uh, but I'm here mainly to really uh, express my uh, uh, gratitude to both of you and especially uh, because when, you know, this invitation came, obviously immediately I RSVP'd because anything, you know, to be in presence of my good friend, uh, but only at the Council on Foreign Relations, he said, Lodi, I want you to make some remarks. So, so anyway, thank you, and I'm really glad to be uh, here, and uh, I do hope that since I do have some minor kind of affiliation, uh, if there's anything that I can also do to contribute, uh, because this whole issue about social justice, uh, you know, you talked about me being reincarnate, you know, uh, Lama, because, you know, we Buddhists uh, and Hindus, some others, we believe in rebirth. And the Tibetans have this idea of certain people being able to re re take rebirth uh, by choice. Uh, I, I didn't think I, you know, uh, came by choice. But anyway, I'm trying to kind of take a rebirth without leaving this physical body because you're talking about ICT, and uh, we have with us, you know, my colleague, new ICT president of the ICT, uh, Matthew Makachi. Uh, so I'm now trying to kind of move into a slightly different area. In fact, I may spend most of my time in Bangkok working with an organization that I'm affiliated. Uh, this is a group of people we call ourselves INEV, International Network of Engaged Buddhists. So this is exactly what you know, we've been trying to talk about. So maybe we can collaborate more and uh, get some more thoughts that you can bring out, the two of you, using another book in the future. So thank you very much for your uh, invitation. Thank you. <laughs> so I expect that we have a number of people in the audience who would like to ask questions of the panelists talk a little bit about the book, and we actually have a microphone in the back, which Sarah Grabowski is holding, so I would encourage people to find Sarah Grabowski and go to the microphone. As you're doing that, I, I wanna note one thing. We've talked about the importance of this book as a Georgetown project, and also the importance of this book as it connects to our students here at Georgetown, and if I might, I wanna read the dedication, because this was something that was very important to me and Mark this book is dedicated to MSFS students, past, present, and future, as they work to set the world on fire. And at the bottom of the page, we have in Latin, ad majorum de glorium in quae hominum salutum to the greater glory of God and the welfare of humanity, the motto of the Jesuits. So, questions, comments, anecdotes. <laughs> yes, sir. And perhaps identify yourself 
uh, as you go to the mic, or as the mic comes to you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for an interesting panel. My name is uh, Steve Silverstein. Uh, I used to work for Georgetown University, um, but otherwise uh, I am not a student here. Um, I got my master's in public policy from uh, the Kennedy School, so I have some background in public policy Harvard. and IR. Uh, here we go. Here's the question that I have. This is for um, Madam. I'm sorry. Nicole, that's fine. Nicole, okay, Nicole. Yeah, <laughs> I'm Steve. Um, I have a tendency. I'm going to preface this. I have a tendency to be passionate, so please don't take it. this, uh, you know, any in the wrong way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I would contest that the flourishing of faith-based NGOs in, in the developing world speaks to an underlying desire to advance human dignity. And I say this having just worked for an evan evangelical uh, faith-based organization that's based in South Africa. I was, I was in West Africa. Mm -hmm. um, to the contrary, examples are manifest of FBOs that have played a larger role in undermining human dignity. Uh, many of them use humanitarian intervention as a Trojan horse to advance a very intolerant agenda. I think that we would all agree with that, given examples such as ISIS in Syria and Iraq, Hamas, Hezbollah uh, in the Middle East. Take also, uh, on the other side, evangelical churches that, operated, that operate in um, Uganda and have helped to advance a very intolerant uh, anti-homosexual agenda over there. And then you could look at other types of faith-based organizations, such as uh, Greenpeace, I mean, not traditionally faith-based, but kind of, that has its own type of a, well, they have an environmental, environmentalists, but that, that's a religion to some. Uh, they have an agenda that is advancing anti-GMOs in places that potentially would need GMOs. Uh, regardless of what you may think, I mean, that's what Greenpeace kind of treats some of these developing countries as pawns in a very large international great game. So, uh, I would like to say not all churches, mosques, and temples are created equally. I think that we would agree with that. So, do we then privilege extremist voices in our discussion of human rights? by dint of their work in providing services that should be provided by the state? Or instead, should we rethink and reshape this international system which allows these organizations an outsized role in human development? Sorry, I'm very nervous, I don't know why. I feel like there's a lot of people, but oh, thank you very much. Steve, don't be nervous. Um, thank you, thank you, I'll jump in. Yep, thank you for your question. Um, first, when you buy the book and you read it, um, you'll read my portion about dealing with organizations like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah, um, they are faith-based organizations. What I deal with in my chapter are faith-based organizations that advance um, what, what most religions have put forward as human dignity in a broad sense. And that I do think that those organizations, ISIS, Hamas, Hezbollah, um, are taking peaceful religions and are interpreting it through very, very narrow lenses for violent and destructive means. And so I put them to the side, not to say that they are not important, in fact, they're tremendously important in, in, in the world today, but to say we need to differentiate when we're talking about faith-based organizations between the group that does include Aga Khan and American Jewish World Service and Catholic Relief Services and Samaritan's Purse from those organizations. And again, not to say that they're not important, but to say that the what I'm focused on in this chapter is that group. I also in the chapter address the fact that there are some challenges that faith-based organizations and how their role is expanding, um, very real challenges. And one of those is how they deal with, and I call them family issues, which include um, issues dealing with women, homosexuality, marriage, childbirth, reproductive rights. Those are not issues where there is always agreement, and, I, and that's a reality. What I would posit is the amount that all of those organizations, even with very differing differing understandings of the family issues, what they have done to advance human dignity, if we were to put that on a scale, as far as providing health care, providing food, providing shelter, providing emergency relief, far, far outweighs where we are in the debate of those other issues. Those issues are very, very important. They're ones that we have to grapple with in the world. I think they get a disproportionate amount of media attention because CNN covers what's controversial, not what's... <laughs> what's not controversial, but the reality, if you look at what faith-based organizations have done just as far as the amount of services that they've provided for basic human dignity and life, um, sustaining life, I think far, far outweighs those other issues. That doesn't mean that we're not gonna debate those and have challenges, and that people are not gonna disagree. We are. Um, but I would say let's put it in perspective of what the impact of those organizations have been in that positive realm versus those areas where we still need to work and debate those issues to 
to get a joint understanding. Thank you, Nicole. Other, Sarah, right next to you. <laughs> Matthias. <laughs> next slide. <coughs> um, thank you for the panel. Um, my name is Matthias Witt. I am an MSFS alum, and uh, I currently work for the Order of Malta's Worldwide Relief Service in the Congo. So uh, if you want a faith-based organization doing healthcare, so I sympathize with some of the points that have been mentioned. My question, I guess, is, is um, primarily to Nicole, but to the other panel members as well, ties in with what Steve, sorry, I forgot your last name, Steve just said as well, which is, um, I tend to see also in my own work um, that we're trying to provide services or we're providing services that I guess in overall understanding the state should still be providing but can't in certain situations and faith-based organizations are stepping in to provide populations with these services because otherwise they wouldn't exist. Out of the idea of human dignity, people deserve primary health care and if the state can't give it to them, somebody must. But I feel like many faith-based organizations, including my own, probably find themselves in a little bit of an identity crisis right now, which is looking at the future. Do we continue to do that primarily to just do the service when it's not being provided? Or do we subscribe to that notion that this really all over the world is the state's responsibility and we primarily try to pressure the state and strengthen the state into fulfilling this role that we believe it's supposed to do. So I don't know if you and the other panel members have any thoughts on where the future of faith-based interventions should be. Should it really be as a substitute for the state or more as, a, mm -hmm. as an activist getting the state to do what the state is supposed to do? I mean, I think it's an excellent question and I really, I do and I'm, I really sound like I'm selling the book, but um, so, yeah. but but I do think that is why the, that this debate is so important because we are at a place where the lines are not clear anymore, <coughs> and we had hoped for a long time that states would do what states should do. States should protect their citizens, and we wouldn't need a uh, responsibility to protect if states would not be abusing their citizens like we see in Syria. <coughs> if states could contain Ebola, we wouldn't need to have this debate about other institutions and what the role of them should be. I can't look into the future and say definitively that faith-based organizations or NGOs or UNDP or the World Health Organization should take over X or Y, but I do think that we, we can't continue to hope that states will just do what states truly are not doing. We are in this new era where um, faith-based organizations and um, multinationals and Yahoo and Google and ISIS are all having these different roles and we have to realize that and we have to we have to relook at what that is and we do need an organizing principle um, I would I would love to see states step up I don't think that they're going to in a lot of places and I do think that a lot of places faith-based organizations are really putting band-aids on very, very big problems. And I'm thankful that they're there to do that. <laughs> it's better than not having a Band-Aid. And I do think that's a struggle that they, that they face because they know that they're not doing, they're not able to change the systemic problems. Um, but they're, it's better that they're there than not. So I don't know the answer, but I do think it does prompt us to really say we need to have this discussion. So if I could just add one quick point. Um, in addition to your question, there's, there's there are other things that the book looks at. Um, the, the problem with states is not just that states don't have the capacity. Sometimes, as Nicole alluded to, they don't have the will. Mm. The will to deal with um, protecting political rights of their people or um, economic opportunity. A bigger message of the book is not those who would go in instead of states, but that states need other actors. Um, in my own chapter on human trafficking, I suggest that states need nonprofits, and there needs to be an active, integrated partnership, because there are certain things that they can do to help find the victims of human trafficking who don't step forward because they're afraid they're going to be treated like they are dirty, disposable, or at fault. I think if we think historically, we tend to think of moments when there was a conception of international relations. So 1648, the Peace of Westphalia, that conceptualized what the state system meant. 1945, when the United Nations was created, that, that gave us a new conception of the international system. Our real claim here is that we have 
devolved. We're kind of muddling through right now with all these different organizations, sometimes working together, sometimes working across purposes with each other. Uh, when we were talking about the book initially, we were saying, you know, when the UN was founded in San Francisco in 1945. Do we need a new San Francisco moment, one that makes sense of the international system today? And I guess our feeling is, yes, we do, but we're not sure what that would look like. And so one of the reasons we're laying out some of these problems is to promote a dialogue, a conversation about what that would look like so we would have more collaboration among these various different kinds of actors as opposed to conflict. Hi, um, I'm Sue Say. I'm a former MSFS student and former student of three of the people on the panel, actually. <laughs> um, so my question is about this uh, the part of the definition of human dignity to do with institutionalization. Um, and I think um, kind of it makes sense when we talk about in terms of service delivery, kind of, you know, people deserve health care and people deserve education. Like, that's something a lot of people can agree on. But when we're talking about governance or, like, political rights, I think there might be more kind of controversy. Um, and just wondering, you know, when we're talking about human dignity, is there something, a consensus you guys came to that, for example, like democracy in the Western model, is that kind of, Sorry. is that the only kind of system that can really promote human dignity or could there be other, other ways to do that? Um, I thank you for that question. Um, and it's, it's good because I'm about to go have the privilege of, of uh, leading the staff of an organization devoted to democracy, political rights, civil liberties. I think actually, you know, I'm really influenced by the thinking of um, the head of International Justice Mission, um, the, uh, Gary Haugen, who has written about how, in essence, so much of the world's poor um, have rights on paper in laws uh, and in treaties, but they can't actually access justice because it's not protected. And so by institutionalizing, we're talking about their being practice. And I think that's as true for political and civil liberties as it is for economic goods and welfare. Um, if someone doesn't have the ability to go seek redress for having their rights being taken away because they are a Dalit, or they are of a minority group, or they are a woman, um, then th that needs to be institutionalized. And that's, that's what I mean. Now, you asked the question about democracy. Um, actually, we've already begun a dialogue about this book. And one of, one of the dialogues um, led us to, to think about the two D words, dignity and democracy. And that's very much on my mind, because books come out, and then I'm about to go uh, lead an organization devoted to democracy. My own view is that democracy is not meaningful unless it delivers dignity. It's fine to have elections, but there has to be some possibility of people, you know, having agency to be able to thrive. You don't, you don't guarantee people equal results, but you have to give them equal access to opportunity. And it needs to be social recognition. Um, so a country that wipes out an entire category of people as not having the same rights as, as others is not fully a, a democracy. A democracy to be um, really legitimate and real has to deliver dignity. Yeah. And I agree absolutely with that. One thing I would say, when I think of, say, governance structures, one thing that worries me, and we've certainly seen this in practice, is someone comes into a particular country, says, okay, we're going to have elections, we're going to do this, and, and that's going to solve all the problems. And obviously, it, it may help or it may create more problems because sometimes you're imposing an artificial structure in a place where that kind of structure doesn't make sense. So when I look at building a governance structure, ideally, the goal, sort of the, the telos, where we want it to go, is a thriving democratic system which delivers on dignity. But as we start out, I really see two pillars, legitimacy and dignity. As I look at any governance structure, I want it to be perceived to be legitimate by the people it is seeking to serve. Maybe that means the individuals are being elected through some process, or maybe it means they have some kind of historic basis where the people attribute legitimacy. But I would say start with legitimacy, legitimacy of governing institutions that then grant dignity, and then build up to promoting greater and greater democratic institutions through history. Yes, sir. 
Sarah, you wanna? So uh, I'll let Sarah pick because the lights are in my eye. <laughs> Yes, that's good. Match the mic. Um, thank you, first of all. My name is Arnab. I'm a first-year MSFS student. Um, thank you, first. I've always wanted a book dedicated to me, so I can <laughs> kind of cross that off the bucket list. Um, Professor Legan, you touched on this a bit, but I wanted to see if you could just elaborate on the potential for um, an organizing principle of human dignity to be abused. Um, Hypothetically, if a large, cold country invaded a smaller country in Eastern Europe, let's say, um, under the guise of maybe protecting human dignity, would that be an abuse, or can you maybe talk about different sides of that? I guess the story of international politics is um, brazen steps being taken in the name of broader principles. and. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we see, since you mentioned a player, Russia has a tendency to point fingers at others and suggest that they are intervening um, using, you know, bogus invocations of principles. Um, I don't pretend that the dialogue that this book seeks to, to launch will solve those problems um, or prevent the misuse of the concept. But the more that there is a discussion about a consensus on, you know, what dignity looks like, without perfect unanimity, it will be harder to um, invoke those concepts uh, and in, in, in a bogus fashion. Looks like it's Patricia Wrightson. You have your hand up in the back. Patricia Wrightson. Uh, Despite the lights, I can tell. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Patricia Wrightson, and I'm one of the faculty who teaches global ethics at the McCourt School of Public Policy. And Tony and I go way back, because I used to teach for uh, the School of Foreign Service and the Department of Foreign Politics a gazillion years ago. Anyhow. Um, as a member of the loyal opposition, which I feel is a role I have often played with Tony, uh, I'm having a problem with the concept of human dignity. Not that I don't agree with it, because I do, but I am very much a member of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And it's not clear to me how this concept is going to do any better than any other concept that comes out of a particular tradition in trying to create some kind of, although I know you're not using the term universalist consensus, you are trying to talk about going across cultures, but I don't see how human dignity really is a cross-cultural concept, although I might wish it were. But then I think it is a radical concept so I really like your dedication about setting the world on fire, but then I want to know how radical do you want to get? Because it is radical and it is pushy. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. <laughs> so I'll turn to my radical friend to start off on this, and then I'll follow up. Well, uh, you know, the, we, don't, we don't claim uh, we, 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 we wouldn't agree that the human dignity concept is solely a Western or a Judeo-Christian concept. But, you know, we stand in the shoes that we're in, and so we identify a number of threads that come from Western or Judeo-Christian traditions. It's actually part of the, the pivot we're trying to make um, in, in this book is to, to look at the way that human dignity is, it has some reach um, that helps create the premise for human rights. We do not want to chuck human rights. We don't want to chuck all the laws and the treaties and the dialogue about human rights. That would be throwing away some protections and, and um, great things that have happened since the Universal Declaration on Human Rights came out. But we think that there, there is actually a possibility um, for greater consensus if you get away from some of the set piece debates that you see. There's been these endless debates about political and civil liberties versus economic and, and social rights. Um, and we think that perhaps if you back away from these things, you, you, you might you know, 
uh, make some progress. I, you know, the UN has moved forward in, in many ways. Kofi Annan, for instance, as captured in a chapter in this book, has really moved beyond sovereignty to humanitarian protection and democracy. But it is kind of surprising the degree to which some of the debates in the UN look a whole lot like the 1970s. And perhaps if we step back, we could actually strengthen human rights by going to the premise. Yeah, our claim really is that human dignity is more primordial, if you will, than human rights. And so we're trying to get to something which is more foundational. And yet at the same time, I think what Don said was extraordinarily instructive. In giving talks on this, I've heard many people say, whenever we hear human rights, we think, that's the West, that's the United States, they're trying to impose our definition on, or their definition on us. Whereas when you say human dignity, that resonates in a different way. Almost like going from humanitarian intervention to responsibility to protect. So while we, we do think it's philosophically, if you will, more primordial, more foundational, we also think it has a greater potential to bring about this kind of universality, this kind of agreement. But we also recognize, and something Mark said, is we're, we're putting this out. We have a working definition. We want a real dialogue that is going to engage other parts of the world and hopefully reach a new consensus beyond something that we're actually arguing in the book. All right, let's go to, there's, a, there's somebody all the way in the back, Sarah Grabowski, so why don't we go all the way in the back and we'll work our way down front. Um, hello, I'm Mariana. I'm an undergraduate student here. I'm a senior in the SFS. Um, and my question goes along with the last question. Um, and you mentioned it before of the distrust that comes with humanitarian interventions, especially after um, the use of humanitarian inter interventions for political um, interest of the, the US or other powerful states. So my question is more of what has been done or what could be done to regain confidence in humanitarian work and to sort of try to divide um, the political and interest and intelligence missions from uh, actual humanitarian work um, to gain trust and reach uh, areas that maybe not that are, maybe are not being reached uh, today because of distrust. Don, Don, would you want to share some ideas on that? Well, I, I happen to believe that language is, uh, is very important because if you're sloppy in your use of language, you may end up giving others an excuse uh, for pursuing policies uh, that you don't like and which are really inconsistent with the concept you're talking about. Let me give you an example. Uh, at the time that uh, the Libya operation took place, the UN resolution had nothing in it about regime change. It was to protect the citizens of Libya from the actions of the government. If you look at the statements that came out of NATO, they were pretty good. They always talked about protecting citizens. You look at the statements coming out of politicians, whether it was our own or the British or others, they tended to talk about regime change. And it was not very long before uh, some countries that had supported the original concept, now you can get into an argument as to whether or not you can protect citizens without getting rid of Mr. Gaddafi, I don't know. But I, I, I simply want to suggest that if we would have been much better off had we stuck to the language, to the concept of protecting citizens and not burdening the concept of responsibility to protect with the questionable and very contentious idea of regime change. Uh, let me give you another example. When uh, the Haitian problems were in full flower, uh, this, the Soviet Union, it's in its last days, and at the early part of the 
of the Russian Federation, proposed the concept, the idea that we will give you free rights to do whatever you want to do in Haiti, uh, but we would like the same thing, the same rights in the near abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, we were dealing with two different concepts. Uh, we picked up on that one, and, and it was slapped down. Uh, the Russians still think of it that way, but no one else does. Uh, it, it just seems to me that the language which is used and, and the uh, avoiding the muddying of the concept is going to be very, very important in the implementation. If you let implementation undermine the concept, I think we're in trouble. You have to constantly, constantly push forth the concept and to make sure that the implementation is consistent with it. In, in the final analysis, the concept is what you are trying to get people to rally around. You don't want the, uh, the, uh, the concept muddy so that uh, people can uh, use it for their own purposes at some point in the future. Thank you, Don. I think we have time for two more questions, and I see these two gentlemen down here, gentleman in the suit and the gentleman uh, in the suit without the tie. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks. I'm uh, George Dragnich, and I had the pleasure of working with Ambassador Lagon in the International Organizations Bureau before I retired from the Foreign Service and subsequently served as an Assistant Director General of the International Labor Organization in Geneva. And I'd make a comment that there's a corollary to the failure of states and the failure of international organizations, because I very strongly believe, as I know Mark does, in the multilateral system, but it's one that we have to reform. The problem is, as this, the states have, have failed, and you have the growth of these organizations, these are, are state-based organizations. Member states is the term that we use. As, as somebody said to me, because they didn't like the uh, Kofi Annan's Global Compact, they said, George, this is the United Nations, not the United Corporations. I happen to be a, a fan of the Global Compact. And so when you find a, a single organization in the UN system, which was the one I was uh, an ADG at, the ILO, it has non-state actors, workers and employer groups. A historic vestige going back to its Versailles, Treaty of Versailles origins in 1919. And there you could get non-state actors, the workers complaining about forced labor in Myanmar, the employer groups complaining about the near assassination of an employer representative in Venezuela. You could get that. But the, the, the role of, of NGOs becomes increasingly important because these organizations are hostage to their member states and all the voting blocks in them. And as Ambassador McHenry said, these NGOs are a real pain. But thank God they're there. Thank you. Thank you. The ILO, by the way, is a fascinating organization because it's designed predates, differently than anything predates, else. It predates it. The treaty of Versailles. Yes, so it's a fascinating organization. And perhaps, I, I, without giving specific examples, that kind of organization could be a model for future international entities that could engage in some of these issues. George, I'm not going to comment because I don't, want, I don't think I can improve on that. I agree um, with, with your premise. Um, you know, we need to leaven those intergovernmental organizations that are solely focused on the on premise of states. This is a theme in this book. In global politics is about human beings, mm -hmm. and it should be about human beings as opposed to parochial interests of states. So the gentleman, he does have a tie on. The gentleman here, yes. <laughs> Joe Lacante. Not that I was judging. <laughs> yeah, Joe Lacante with uh, the King's College of New York City. Thanks for a terrific discussion panel. Congratulations on the book, uh, gentlemen. Looking forward to reading it. Uh, this is kind of with, with a historian's eye for a minute. I'm not a political scientist, so bear with me. You know, when you think about the real first debate that we had in the West, the major debate we had in the West on human dignity, it kind of began more or less in the 17th century, the Lockean Revolution, uh, Britain's Glorious Revolution, and then, you know, 100 years later, it's the American and the French Revolutions. But what was going on for decades was a debate. 
the kind of debate that you guys are trying to initiate, it seems to me. And the debate was happening at all levels, happening in, in the churches, the, the, the newspaper uh, presses, and the coffee shops, the political uh, assemblies, and the parliaments and all. And so people were beginning to uh, internalize these ideas about human dignity, natural rights, natural law. It was happening in a mostly religious context. You get the enlightenment coming in. My point is, the political revolutions that came out of that, they grew out of this culture. They grew out of that debate, which is why I think it's so important to have it. The, the healthy political revolutions that came out of that were grounded in this you know, decades-long debate. So the question is, where do you guys want to see this debate happen? When you think about a region of the world, a place in the world, where would you like to see the, the debate first joined so that we can get this process going in a way, uh, kick-started again, so that maybe the next political revolution, maybe unlike the, the Arab Spring, which seems to be devolving into a, uh, an eternal Arab winter, maybe we can have a better result uh, with, with the next political revolution if there really is this debate and discussion about human dignity? Well, I will tell you, I wouldn't start in the UN. Uh, much as I, th I think the UN is, is uh, greatly necessary. And, you know, I, I think our book suggests that there, you know, there shouldn't be another San Francisco moment at a conference because this dialogue has to be uh, carried out over time in different places. But I really think the university uh, and um, the internet are dimensions um, of where this dialogue occurs. I just, I, I just want to say, a personal opinion, um, that if I play any part in such a dialogue, I'm going to speak for my part that I think not only does democracy require dignity, but that dignity can be best achieved through the slow and serious institutionalization of democracy. And there will be people who disagree with me and those who, you know, agree with me. Thank you, my friend. I want to thank Lodi and Nicole and Don. And I want to thank all of you for coming. Now, a, a, a couple of announcements in the great Georgetown tradition. Uh, first of all, a number of people and institutions made this event possible. So I want to thank Master of Science and Foreign Service Program, the Berkeley Center, the Mortara Center. A very special thanks to Georgetown University Press, Richard Brown, Jackie Bylard, all those from the press who are here. You were indeed a wonderful group to work with. Thank you all. So when you write your next book, Go for Georgetown University Press. 